So uh, let's just with some basic questions here. So guys, the basic one, what is agile? Who would like to answer that? It's a challenge, I know. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of customers call every day, hey, hey what is agile? What is that? What should I answer? <laughs> I'll start with, Marco? it's a lot of things. It's an umbrella okay. right now that encompasses yeah. so much. And uh, DevOps, uh, there's different types of agile, different types of methodology. It does encompass so much. And the name is being kind of overused in some respects, but it also is synonymous with many other things. Uh, did you that? Uh, I don't think uh, uh, focusing on time box, uh, iterative, uh, and uh, you know trying to deliver on your first iteration, uh, deliver an increment of your, or actually first increment, increment deliver an iteration of your software, not waiting for six months to deliver something, but within a week or two weeks deliver something that actually works. Um, and the, the value of this is you're getting feedback Mm -hmm. uh, quickly, okay. and you're able to adjust quickly. Okay. And you've heard me say this before. You don't like this. But <laughs> okay. If you're going to fail, you're going to fail early, right? Because you'll find out right away that things are not going to work. Krista, would you like to add something? Yeah. Um, if you go to Google and you know you type in agile software development, a lot of your search results are going to come back and say that it is a style of project management which kind of gets all the hairs on the back of my neck standing up. Um, <laughs> I, I disagree with that. I disagree with Google in that respect. Um, I, I think it's more, I would fo focus more on the culture. Um, it is a way that you can manage projects, but if you don't have the culture, it doesn't matter how much you manage that project. It's just not going to work. So for me, it would be a culture and a mindset. Uh, and we were talking about this uh, a few minutes ago, and you didn't mention uh, something about the journey and a destination. What's a journey for you? So journey or a destination? Um, agile for me is definitely not a destination. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say the, the actual most experienced person in Canada, that supreme agilist, is still not at their destination. Um, part of the core of Agile is uh, retrospectives, reflection, and improvement. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, even just us being humans, we are constantly capable of more improvement. Mm -hmm. So for me, there's definitely not a destination, it's a continual journey. Okay, so you brought something very interesting. By the way, this morning, a customer, potential customer called me and said, hey, I want to be Agile next year. <laughs> so, who, oh, what do you think about it? Wow, um, I, I would think the first thing mm -hmm. to being agile is, is adopting an agile culture. You can be, you can have the most amazing team that will deliver stuff in a week if your, your ops team is like, okay, we'll see you in, in six months before you get your servers to deploy stuff. Or your executives are saying, well, yeah, that's great if you're being agile, but I want all these requirements to be completed for, you know, before you can do anything. Um, it's not going to be successful. Uh, and I think Krista has a good analogy for that. I'll let her talk to you about that. But uh, so, <laughs> getting the culture, getting the executive leadership to to believe in agile Absolutely. mindset, or at least having the trust to let you give you enough room to you know hang yourself, uh, is is important. Um, okay. Michael, what do you what would you say for that? There's a great discussion going on right now about doing agile or being agile. Mm -hmm. And the difference is quite significant because people see the rules and you have to go through all these different steps. And sometimes you have to sit back and say, well, what was the goal of this? It's working closer to the customer. Am I really bringing the customer into this? Or am I just going through the ceremony? Uh, retrospectives. So am I just doing, we're talking about retrospectives. Am I just going through the formality? Or am I actually looking at something that we can improve? And that continuous improvement mindset is so important. Uh, recent survey, uh, State of Agility, version one is a great survey. Two thirds of respondents said that their, their companies were just uh, maturing in, in the growth of maturing. And that was people doing agile for five, 10 years in many cases. So that growth, that's a, that's a case of, it's very synonymous with what we do. And it's also a lot of how we work in terms of the community and, and talking about things and having ideas and saying, does this work? Or we tried this, or this didn't work. Well, you know, like that, it's not a textbook, it's, um, it's a way of uh, connecting with people.
Collaboration is the word that I think about most of It's an interesting point that you bring up because I actually worked at a company and we did reviews, which is, for those of you who don't know, part of the Agile process, um, where you review what has been developed with your stakeholders and usually uh, the end users, where you get that feedback. And the reviews that they were doing was with the development team and the executives, but not the end users. And the end users were writing in and saying, there's not enough communication, we don't know what's going on, and, and, and the technical people are going, well, we're running agile, like, what's their problem? And I'm like, maybe you should invite them to the review. And they're like, what? <laughs> and it was like this big shock, and it's like, no, that, that's what they're for, like, for them. And, and, you know, in their mind, they were following the textbook, but even missing such a small piece, it, it sort of falls apart. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for example, uh, in your experience, uh, how companies start becoming agile? So they wake up and suddenly they realize, hey, you know, I want to become agile. Oh, good. Do you want to start with me? No, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I think, so probably, the, and there's lots of different opinions on that. A lot mm -hmm. of people will say you start agile, you get everybody to be agile, and you know, you'll be successful. In my experience, that doesn't work like that. You start with a team. Um, and you first, first of all, you start by socializing with the organization. We're doing Agile, and this is what we're going to do. And you need to be really clear about, we're not going to move your cheese. We're not going to change everything overnight. Uh, this team is going to be uh, working in an Agile environment, uh, or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, and you find that one kind of Team that that's probably your uh, your scapegoats, but they're also <laughs> if they're going to be successful, they're going to be the people that are going to become ambassadors, and they're going to tell you know the other teams how to adopt and how to use agile. You want to celebrate your your first successes, and so the the, the one thing to do then is mm -hmm. don't take like the biggest project you have and say we're going to go agile. Um, you know you want to take something that. You can actually deliver, you can be successful, and then start telling people, okay, so this team has been successfully able to do this. Um, and uh, one of the keys here is you probably want to start with people that know uh, about Agile. Uh, you don't want people to just wing it, because then, like Krista was talking about, uh, they'll fail and they'll say, well, we're doing Agile, and so Agile is crap. No, you want people that know what they're doing. Uh, you want those people to be kind of the, uh, the people that help that team deliver, and then you want to socialize and you want to train and stuff like that. But there's a lot of knowledge transfer and there's a lot of training that needs to be done. And again, if the, state, if the executive uh, team is not ready for that, mm -hmm. it's not going to work so That's well. That's a challenge. Yeah. Okay. And for you, Carissa? Um, yeah, I agree with you. Both starting small, getting training. Um, and sticking to what is considered true agile. So I'll, I'll share the analogy. It's actually a story from Michigan Birthday. Um, he equated agile to being a tool, like a hammer. So you use a hammer to build a deck. So you're building your deck and you're swinging away and the nails are going in just great. And after a couple hours, you're like, oh man, my wrist is just killing me. But you keep swinging and really starting to feel the pain and you look at the hammer and you say, well if I took off this real big heavy part at the end, well then it wouldn't hurt my wrist so much. So you take that part off, but what are you left with? Well, you don't have a hammer anymore, you got a stick. So that's kind of like agile. You're going to start the process and you might start to feel some pain, but you have to remember that you're building strength at the same time. And if you don't go through that process and you don't continue to build that strength and you just remove that piece, well, you're not left with Agile anymore. You're left with something completely different. And you're not going to build that deck with that stick. <laughs> so for me, it would be trying to stick to true sort of Agile practices as best you could. Right. And for you, Michael, what do you think? Well, Agile has become quite prevalent. It's growing. I think everyone's probably had some exposure to it at different levels. And uh, sit back and look at what were the expectations, what are the drivers, the problems that's being questioned. Quite often it's, we want to go faster. Mm -hmm. How do we go faster? And the benefits of Agile, sometimes you know, they look for that to be the number one, but the number one benefit of Agile is flexibility, visibility, mm -hmm. and collaboration. 
So you want to be able to sell the flexibility. You know, what's you know, what's your 12 month roadmap? Well, it's actually it's, you change with reacting to market pressure. Mm -hmm. So you want to be able to share where where agile is adding value, and in some cases, it's not really uh, what is the expectations to begin with. And uh, and I think training, support from others, working together, trying. Uh, one of the coaching, Lisa Atkins, uh, one of her mantras is uh, celebrate failure. And, you know, with a two iteration, if you find something that doesn't work, it's uh, you save the company so much and you can move forward and you've learned. And those are the small steps in R&D that really bring you know, the best products to market. Uh, this, that brings a lot of questions. What areas, departments, can we implement that mm. 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 Uh, well, I, I know for a fact that if you just have the development team work in Agile, mm -hmm. uh, the ops team or the, the IT infrastructure team is not uh, is not in on the secret, uh, it's not going to work so well. Uh, I'll give you an example. I've worked, mm -hmm. I did a project for the interior government. Uh, nobody for the government here? <laughs> Before I insult anybody? <laughs> so uh, we implemented a full solution in six weeks. And it was small increments of two weeks. So in three in three sprints, we actually implemented something. It took the government nine months to provision the servers so that we could deploy it to a QA environment. Um, so you want your ops team or your IT infrastructure team to be to be able to work with you. Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about DevOps a bit later. But that's mm -hmm. definitely one of the teams that you want. If you're deploying stuff every week, every two weeks, and it's being deployed in production, it's actually being used, you probably want your help desk people to be aware of it as well. Um, so that's, that's, and did I mention the IT executive or the executive? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I agree with Hugo. At different places that I worked at, you know, Agile was implemented in one department and other departments were resistant. Mm -hmm. So you become creative with how you can bring Agile to them. Uh, Hugo was sharing a story about, mm -hmm. you know, just walking and going for a coffee. Well, secretly, that was the daily stand-up, going for coffee every day and getting those updates. And, and people adopt it and embrace it that way because you don't scare them with words like, you know, change and agile. You're like, oh, let's just go for coffee. And you sort of implement these things slowly. So, um, yeah, I, I just concur with Hugo. It has to be sort of organization-wide. Can we implement in every department at the time? You know, I've seen so many great examples. Uh, mm -hmm. I've worked with the out of CERN, uh, different areas that you never expect where principles would actually help. Mm -hmm. And uh, but one of my team members came into work one day and said, this is the best thing ever. My kids are finally doing what I asked. But we don't have to push them. We put the to do, doing, done, and they get their allowance. And, uh, and another friend of mine, he has a Leeds engineering company, about 20 project managers. And over he said, what do you do? I said, well, I'm an agile, a scrum master coach. He was on a plane one day and he's reading a book on agile. He goes, why do you tell me about this? You know, just like, and it, it's not a technology area they're in. They're in a lot of, uh, they write a lot, they present a lot, they do a lot of things that aren't traditionally uh, technology. And uh, they're adopting all the practices that fit. And again, it's the problem, what the aspect you're trying to, what you're looking to solve. And, uh, and you experiment. It doesn't mean that here's the answer. We'll do a scrum, we'll do a sprint, and that'll work. Maybe if the sprint's not, you know, I think this is the doing agile, being agile. People sometimes try to impose agile to a level that's too rigid. Mm -hmm. And sometimes opening things up a bit can actually speed things up. So it's that creativity. And experience helps. Sure. You know, there's some rules that, like, I don't like to change the time box. I think, uh, you know, whatever the time box is, that shouldn't change. Because then you have the sense that it could change. You know, I don't like to change the, the team that can help. Mm -hmm. Now the team can focus on scope, focus on delivering the product. Mm -hmm. So let's change the secrets. You're starting <laughs> here, let's start there right now. Uh, what kind of tools or techniques would you recommend well, as the best techniques? First thing, kill me sitting down with a jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Whiteboard standing up, uh, getting together, breaking up into groups. Mm -hmm. It is a really collaborative type of exercise. And uh, post-its, markers are the number one. This is something I heard from uh, I heard from other places, uh, you know, taking courses first. And I said, no, no, what about Jira? What about Trello? What about these are all you know, great. I didn't understand it until we scaled to the point where Scrum Master said, I can't keep the board, the Trello up to what the board's doing. 
and or the teams can work together. So when you see it in action and see it happening, you know, trust me when I say the, the real tools are, are it makes it such a difference. Visualization, seeing it in place. Uh, there's so many tools out there in terms of what an organization needs and needs. And part of that's the necessary steps to follow it, but I think the tools don't always keep up to what people are doing. You just want something to, again, not impede the sprint, but uh, I think Jira is probably the most common version one, Trello, there's so many different ones out there, but it shouldn't be about the tool. Uh, you know, Scrum, I see people sitting in the room with the, up on the screen and looking through the tool and everybody's heads down. Somebody says, yes. Sorry to break it. Okay. Uh, I'm just thinking, like, uh, does it apply to all industries at all? Because, say, car manufacturing, or before we go into tools, uh, uh, what kind of industries does Well, there's great examples. Kanban came out of the car industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's different aspects that do. I think we're, you know, we've seen some examples of it in different industries. And, uh, and also, technology is pervasive now. It is it's becoming a part, companies are becoming digital. Digital is becoming what they do. Who they are, more so. So you see the synergy with, with that happening as well. Yeah, but some industries, they have their scope very clear. This is what we need to do. Yeah. And uh, so everything is like predictive. So how do we adapt? Or how do we apply agile to in that situation? Well, in many cases, you know, agile is for complex, unknown, where you challenge and multiple people working on it. It doesn't necessarily, Scrum in that respect, doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily required for that situation. What it does bring is some things though, the visibility and accountability, openness, there's a lot of values that come from some of the steps in there. So I think it could be used in various ways, but it depends very much on the situation. Even within technology, every team is different, every you know, software, where you are. So there's a, there's a yeah. couple of formula. Yeah, yeah. Well, even keep that question for a while. Oh, then okay. Then right, okay. Uh, sorry, going back to tools, I totally agree with you. I am a sticky affectionado. I love my whiteboard. Um, but I will say for co-located teams, I know true agile is more about, you know, a team that is all in the same room, but sometimes we can't avoid it. You know, we have a team in Kiev or, or whatever. And in that sense, we're going to rely on some sort of virtual technology to keep the teams in touch. We even tried, um, at a company I worked at to have a sticky board and have a, a camera pointing at the sticky board, but then I've got someone messaging yeah. from another country going, can you move my sticky from, and, <laughs> okay, it doesn't really sure. work in this situation. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I've used um, Jira, like you said, a pretty good tool, and TFS, which isn't TFS anymore. It's Visual Studio. Visual, yes. <laughs> and, and it actually has virtual sticky. So um, yeah. that's probably a really great one if, if you know you have teams that are in different locations. It creates a similar experience. Yeah, exactly. But what other techniques do you use? Do you use usually when you work with a team or something? I would say the base of all of my techniques is mm -hmm. communication. Mm -hmm. Just communication, communication, communication. And it doesn't have to be as painful as that sounds. <laughs> okay. It's just having conversations with people, mm -hmm. letting them know what you're doing, and um, like I said, you know, going for that morning coffee and calling it the morning coffee walk instead of uh, your daily stand-up, mm -hmm. doing things in non-threatening ways, um, and yeah, just. And why, out there. what do you do you, when that person? doesn't like too much to talk, or is too shy, or it's not comfortable with you, I don't know you, what, what kind of... What are you talking about? Everyone loves me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I talk for them, I can talk all day. <laughs> um, you warm, you find, you find something that would be in common with that person. If it's not coffee, maybe it's tea. If it's, if it's not coffee or tea, maybe it's a walk outside because they're a nature lover, or you know, you find some common ground with that person. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. And the, the Chris is relating his story. Uh, so I was working in this large consulting company, um, and uh, the team didn't want to talk to anybody. Like they, they're like, leave me alone. I'm coding. And, and so. Um, couldn't have them go to scrums because that was, you know, we're wasting everybody's time for, for 15 minutes. So I started bribing people. I started saying, you know what, I'll buy you coffee. Let's go for coffee. 
And in those 15 minutes that we're getting coffee, I ask, okay, so what do you do today? You know, what are you gonna do today? Any problems? And you know, the first day I was kind of, it felt like I was interrogating people, but uh, after a while I'd hear the other team members talking to each other and they started exchanging ideas about how they could solve a problem. And then maybe three months into the project, the, the CTO comes to me and says, uh, I heard your team is spending a lot of time doing coffee and you know, we're paying you guys and uh, can you stop it? I said, okay, I'll tell you what, tomorrow come for coffee uh, and just watch. And so he came, the CTO came uh, next morning, he listened to the conversations that were going on over coffee and he, yeah, at the end of the conversation he's like, I've heard more in these last 15 minutes that I've had over the last several hours of status meetings with my project manager. I'm coming back tomorrow and I'm buying coffee for everybody. Like, and, and so, and I've had the conversation with many clients um, because they'll say, oh, it's a waste of time. Why are you doing this? Why are you standing up for 15 minutes or, you know? But it's really about, you know, I mean, if you know developers out there, right there, I mean, first of all, they're probably not very good with people. They're like working with their computers and they like doing their stuff and they're so tunnel vision that it feels like you have to rip them away from their computer to find out what's going on. Uh, you've probably been in 90 projects where the developer can't even compile his project for like nine months. And so how, as a project manager or whatever you want to call yourself, how can you uh, gauge how well you're doing or you know, how can you tell people uh, where this close to being done? You don't know because your project doesn't even compile. So you're focusing on smaller deliverables, smaller you know, week increments or two week increments and you get to see something every time. So let's bring a scenario here. I have a friend, he has a startup, and he's working with some colleagues, but they are not co-located. But they want, they want to be agile. Open question. What do you suggest? It's open. Co-located. Co-located. Move them. Move them. Why? What, what, what are the benefits of that? You know, unfortunately, we had Cisco Telepresence in Vancouver and Toronto, some of the best collaboration technology in the mm -hmm. world, and things changed to 110% when we got in the room together. Mm -hmm. And then after work, go up for a beer together. You know, coffee, yeah. beer, it's amazing the change in these uh, dynamics. Uh, I see a few years in the back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, uh, you know, the, the, the principles are the same, mm -hmm. but the execution is quite different. And it is it is harder over phone calls. So you're you know doing it. I am you know collaborative environments are good if you can get a camera. That mm -hmm. that does help. And, uh, it, it helps, but I will say that time zone challenges like they can be very difficult too, right? Like someone's booking you into a meeting that they think is at four o'clock, but it's actually seven at night for you. So <laughs> restructuring too. Sometimes you know this is a great one. I had a, an offshore team in India, and they were trying to participate in Scrum, but just off by 12 hours. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we changed the type of work so that they had a, a component of the work all to themselves mm -hmm. that would then be checked in and work together. And there's one person who attended both and acted in the bridge. So uh, he had a different schedule from us. He you know, kind of crossed the time zones. Mm -hmm. And for that period of time, he represented that, that team. But then that team had a cohesive, they were strong team themselves. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't divided up. No. Okay. I think a lot of us have commented about co-locating is important and it's what we have to understand is you're writing software right software is is intellectual capital it's ideas that people have that they're turning into a language that the computer can understand if people are having fun and they're stimulated and they're challenged you're going to get awesome solutions if people are just like oh i hate this or i'm, on my, I'm watching oprah and i'm doing my, my stuff in my underwear it, you're not going to get the same kind of quality. So it's not that you have to be physically in the same room together. It's you have to create an environment that will stimulate these people. And I mean, if you work for Chris, she'll throw stuff at you and stuff like that. True Yes, yes. <laughs> I still have the bumps to prove it. Uh, but that's that's what it's about. It's about creating that environment that encourages people to to solve like solve problems in a creative way. Um, and uh, I mean, once one technique that I use is the half hour rule. Developers are usually very proud. They don't want to tell people that they don't know about something. So we'll do we'll do the half hour rule. If you think that 
uh, we're going to think you're stupid because because you're asking um, how to solve a problem and you work on something for like two weeks without telling anybody. I guarantee you, I'm going to make you feel more stupid if I if I find that out. So the rule is you have half an hour, and if after half an hour you haven't figured out the solution, escalate. Phone a friend. Let's call Microsoft. Let's call Bill Gates. Whatever. Like, mm -hmm. we'll you know let's let's ask people because often what you'll find out is the guy that sits next to you has run into this problem last week, and you you were so proud that you didn't want to ask. So uh, one project, Chris and I was working at. We had what was it the Viking hat? You have to wear. Yeah. So you had to wear a Viking hat. You find out that that uh, you wasted everyone's time. And so guess what happened? It, it was fun, right? People didn't want to do it at first, but it became the fun thing. And all of a sudden, people were holding each other accountable. Hey, wait a minute. You've been working on this for more than half an hour. You have to wear the hat. And it changed, it changed the behavior. It changed the attitude. So because we're talking about developers, yeah. let's bring the DevOps public here. So what are the challenges right now? What is the DevOps would like to well, this is I'll start off by saying our transformation from Agile transformed into continuous integration, continuous delivery. And so what was the, the forefront of Agile really became, uh, the, the impediment was moving software through the system. And large companies, the larger the company, the more process, the harder that is. DevOps is a really key component of and all the various steps of that. And it comes from XP, which is another part of the umbrella of Agile. Uh, lots to read on it and lots of, uh, Steve was on the, the DevOps panel. There's a phenomenal amount of uh, growth happening in that area right now. Uh, it goes everything from testing, test driven development, through to delivery. And uh, it's, all companies right now, I think, are exploring different aspects of it. So, would you like to add something? Well, yeah, I mean, we were talking about that earlier, where I kind of see it as a spectrum, where mm -hmm. one is you have the continuous delivery where you compile and stuff gets deployed. Uh, but at the other end of the spectrum, and this is kind of where you want to strive to, to get to, is you're not uh, you're not trying to deliver like code to machines. You're trying to uh, own a service, and your product owner is becoming also the service owner. Uh, and you know you have to look at it from that perspective. Is this is a service that we're delivering, and you know. The, not only the ops guys have to wear a pager, but the developers have to wear a pager. You know, like everyone has to be responsive and to be able to adapt. And that goes back to the question you had about which industries, or you had a question about which industries does it apply. I would say any industry where the organization can benefit from being able to respond to change and to be first to market, it's probably a good, a good industry to be able to, to adopt that job. And that's uh, the next question, by the way. So, what are the benefits? Tangible ones, non tangible ones. What are the benefits that you see uh, become that child? I think it's primarily a change in culture and a time to delivery. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond time to delivery, a change in culture and a transparency. Like everyone is sort of on the same page. <coughs> we all know where we're headed, we all know what we're working on. Um, and yeah, just keeping everybody in the loop. The big word is uh, value, and it's something that there's so many projects, work we do, we can't even value. We don't put, spend the time to figure out what the value is, what we're doing. We just do it because we have to do this. And uh, delivering value quicker. So that something's actually, uh, if the project, things change. In three months, things can change. If you are have a six month cycle before you reset re anything, if that project stops, there's nothing to really show for it. Uh, that's very common. It's unfortunately too common in companies these days. Uh, I think the, serve, the, the number is 50% of software is not even used. So I think wow. about half of the work that went into that. If you just minimize, take a, a fraction of that and make it into something that's usable, maybe you can go all the way to the end. But that iteration, that the, so delivering value, and keeping value is the, is the forefront of why the team do what they're doing. I, I love numbers, so I, I was looking at uh, every year this consulting company called the Standish Group. They produce a report called the Chaos Report, which talks about you know software product failure and success. And uh, the interesting thing is the uh, the last copy of the report that I saw, which was probably 2016, uh, they said that for large scale uh, projects. Uh, organizations that use Agile have a 600% um, 
improvement on delivery. Uh, across the board, an average, like no matter what scale uh, the project is, starting from the crappiest team that doesn't talk to each other to a minimum implementation of Agile, uh, they immediately got a 224% uh, improvement on delivery. So again, an organization where you need to be first to market and you need to adapt to, to change, um, that's huge. Uh, the other thing too is, um, you know, if you think the typical IT that, that our stakeholders are familiar with, they get to talk to IT once every three years, and then they ask for a project. And because it's the only time they get to talk to IT, they'll ask for every feature known to man, right? Because they know that they won't get to see you for another while. So they want everything, doesn't matter how important, everything's important, right? But when you start delivering in four week increments, or two week increments, or one week increments, and you're able to show that you're delivering something, <coughs> eventually that relationship changes. They're no longer demanding stuff from you because they say, well, you know what? Okay, you didn't get it done this week, but I know next week you'll probably do something better. And so that relationship becomes more a partnership uh, as opposed to like a hostage situation. It's like you won't sign up on this unless you make this thing from blue to red, right? Um, and it's, it's huge. Um, they, you know, at one organization that I work with, at Krista, uh, they were calling us the new IT. Because the old IT were the, people, the grumpy people that nobody wants to talk to. And they didn't want to talk to them. Mm -hmm. No, 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 I don't want to talk to those guys. Uh, they were talking to the new IT because they knew that we were responsive. And guess what? If we didn't deliver something because we ran into some problems, they knew that a week later or two weeks later we'd, we'd add the feature that we're asking for uh, and they were more willing to, to work with us. And I'd also say the feedback, right? Because I don't know how many people have worked in Waterfall, but you know, you go away, you work on a project and, and you deliver it exactly to spec and you hand it to the client and they go, yep, this is everything we asked for, but it's not what we want. <laughs> So when you're talking to the client at those, you know, reviews every two weeks or three weeks or whatever your iteration is, they get to actually play with it. They get to see what you've developed and they say, oh yeah, okay, well now that I see it, could you tweak this for that? And you get those constant course corrections all the way. So at the end, six months, a year, three years, whatever, they've been involved all the way along. So they're like, yes, this is what I want and it's great. And they fall in love with the solution. Like they, and they, us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and us. <laughs> and I'd say, uh, I'll add, uh, depending on who are you talking, uh, talk with money or talk about passion. So if you talk about teams, members, or people that are working, if you can say that you have a better environment, you have a better and responsive environment. But if you talk to some director, or vice president, and they will be become interested about, when you say about money, you can say that when, once you have a high performance team, you can have much more profit mm -hmm. or reduce expense. You can just mm -hmm. add the conversation or the top of the conversation. Okay, so two more topics and then we open to uh, questions. Um, they are here today. Tomorrow, I really hope they get very excited to, okay, today I'll become a child. What's the best way for the first step? What they should do next? Whatever comes to your mind. Well, not that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not today okay. we're agile. Okay. Not that. That's a good thing. <laughs> What, um, what be going back to sort of what Hugo said, socializing it, um, getting your people trained or getting people that are already trained mm -hmm. in Agile, if, if you have that luxury. Um, not everyone's going to go along for the ride. You're, you might have some turnover and you have to realize that that's going to be a part of the process. But you have to sort of look at your long-term goal um, and see where you want to be. And so that's sort of one of the challenges that you encounter. Um, for me, it would be socializing it and getting people that are trained or training. Okay. Uh, well, it's going to sound weird coming from a consultant who does uh -huh, this, uh -huh. but yeah, hire a consultant. And not <laughs> <laughs> that necessarily mean that if you don't have the skills in house, don't. If you're looking for him, <laughs> that's right. My resume is my customer. <laughs> oh, 
close. Free space, right? Sorry. <laughs> that matters a lot. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean it's the same for every technology, every skill. If you're, don't just wing it, right? I, these guys have heard me say this before. Like when you do agile without using the rigor of agile, it's it's just called fragile, right? It's, you want someone who knows what they're doing to teach your team how, how to do it. If you have someone, great. If you don't, don't. Don't just try to send someone and just try to apply whatever they understood. Like, get the people learning it, doing it, and then send the team members to training so they can become the scrum masters and they can carry the torch. Uh, I guarantee you, if you're going to be successful at, at using Agile, it's going to become kind of an organic, uh, you know, like growth. Other teams are going to say, "Okay, we want to do agile too. How do we, how do we get started?" Uh, and next thing you know, the, the executive uh, team is going to be talking about how agile they are. They don't necessarily understand what they what they're saying, but they're going to be talking about how that's part of the process. Yeah, that's part of the process. Mm -hmm. And you might I think we'll all go back to a different situation. Mm -hmm. Look around and see who else is, is interested. That's the community. That's who you work with and build upon. Uh, move yourself into that area. I found uh, you know I used to manage teams and engagement went up from what seventy percent score to ninety percent. And the problem was that the teams that were in an agile were disengaged, were very unhappy, were happy with uh, so it's a tipping point. And so if you're, if you're Fortunate enough to be part of that tipping point, get into the side, it's actually making change. Yeah. The great book, The Phoenix Project, it, it's, it's kind of the why, you know, how we're going to love what we do with this, and the goal is to do a bit of reading, uh, a little research. It's, it's good. The Phoenix Project is it's one of the best books I've read, and it's not just a dry IT book, it's actually entertaining mm -hmm. for vacation. So, uh, okay. there's, there's another uh, kind of basis to Agile that I think people tend to forget. It's the self-organizing teams, right? Mm -hmm. so you, you don't assign tasks to people. You let people uh, rise uh, and use their skills. Uh, one of the projects I worked on, we had this amazing lady. She was a, a UX expert. Uh, she had been user experience expert, and she had been for the last 10 years. Uh, but she was like a content, uh, like a SharePoint mm -hmm. administrator in her current role. And when she started working with us, we, we uh, quickly encouraged her to, to demonstrate her skills, to, like, to where there was an opportunity for her to use her knowledge and her skills, she should take that on, right? We never assigned it to her, we just encouraged her. Uh, and she, like, I mean, talking about Phoenix here, like she really like, rose from the ashes and she, she really started doing what she was passionate about. And of course, because she was passionate about it, she didn't care. She was working 14 hours a day, or she loved it. Right? She went from doing a job that she hated to a job that she loved, and and everyone benefited from it. So, self-organizing -organiz organizing teams are huge. That's in the work. Before we do our final statement, so let's go to the questions. Okay. Uh, do you want to continue with your question? <laughs> um, Maybe not sure if it was answered. Completely. No, I think I'm, I'm done with that though. But, <laughs> but if we say agile is a, is a journey with no destination as such. So where do you say that, okay, we have done enough? Mm. Mm. Would you like to try that? Not me. <laughs> okay, what, what, what is enough? Oh, that, that's my question. No, 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 that's okay. But what is enough so, for you? So, so, so suppose, like, if I do not know that what I need to do specifically, see, a lot of concept in two weeks, uh, it's change driven, it's value driven. Mm -hmm. But there has to be an end point. So how do you arrive to that? So that's, that's what we're doing. But there isn't, there isn't really an end point. Like, so how do you develop a product in that case? Say, I would say, one. so when you, when you prioritize in your, your backlog, you're looking at uh, diminishing return on investment. You want the highest bang for the buck first. So the best feature, the most important feature for the lowest cost first. And then you go down to the point where all that's left on your backlog is just crappy stuff. That's going to, like, it's not worth keeping a team here for two weeks to change the logo from red to blue. I, I use that example a lot because that's actually happened. But so at one point, you want the stakeholders to say, well, you know what, it's not worth anyone's time to, to do this. But if you're if you're not prioritizing your <coughs> product, if you're not using that diminishing return on investment, 
then you're kind of setting yourself so you're always going to be, your team is always going to be there forever because there's always some really important things that haven't been delivered and they keep on having to be, if you have contractors, they have to be renewed. And, um, you know, we want to, you want to do it in such a way that your team is obsolete as soon as possible. And if, if they're coming back, it's because there's new stuff that is high value yeah. and and that speaks to the value of what's being delivered and focus on the highest value and bring it down, not doing low value. But I think we're talking about the continuous improvement side of it, the expression change in the constant. Mm -hmm. And no matter what happens, it's always changing. And because of that, you optimize for the situation, you don't need to improve anymore, but people change. The organization changes. Uh, so many different things happen. It's amazing when you get to a point where a really high performing team what will happen is it will actually start to go down at some point. I've you know, worked with some amazing teams, and then there's that tipping point. So why? What happened? So then you're to, okay, now the team's improving. How do we bring it back? What are the factors? What's the, what can we add? So suppose, like, the client, do we still make the scope very clear that this is what we're trying to achieve, and or this is what it is, and... Well, the scope is still driven by value and delivery to the point of investment that makes sense. And then it changes to something else. It, uh, it, I think it's possible the ambiguity comes in where when you're doing waterfall, it's here's this book of stuff I'm going to deliver, <laughs> and it's done now, yeah. never ended. Yeah. Whereas I think where he's trying to get to is where, where, where does it end? If I'm con you know, and you made the point you're going zigzagging, you get to the end goals, it changes. How do you make it end? How do you get a project to completion where they go, oh, we're done, and you can go home, not oh, we're still quibbling over bits of yeah, and I would go back to what Hugo said, you know, just the value, getting to the bottom of your backlog and you're changing logo colors or updating stored procs, well, you're not going to keep a whole project team around for that, you know, then and it sort of hands over to the ops team. In terms of process and teams, though, um, I would go back to what you said about um, high-functioning teams. There's a great book, uh, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, and in terms of process and teams, like that's the holy grail. That's where you want to get to. You want to have that high-functioning team. Uh, okay, so we have a few. Do you have a question also? Okay, so you didn't raise your hand, but I'll keep in my mind. So right there, and then we have two gentlemen here, and then you. And uh, probably we'll finish with those four questions, but after we have some time to socialize and be here for a while, so we will be invited to make some questions, okay? So, gentlemen? Uh, having been part of at least six or seven teams that are fully convinced that they're doing agile, but definitively <laughs> or not, how do you deal with the team? Because that's a very hard situation because you're like, well, no, 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 and then they're like, no, no, we're doing these things, and so we're doing it. How do you? Other than leaving the company. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a card? <laughs> <laughs> it just, well, it's, we, it's a we problem. We sort of experienced that uh, at Georgian, right? That's um, very common, I think, in yeah. the hybrid world we're in today. Uh, look out for the opportunities where something can change. Learning about what's happening, different ways of doing it, posing questions to others, saying, our team's doing this. How do we break that? Sometimes if you try to hit it, head on, you'll get resistance from the company saying, no, we have to do this. But if you do it subtly, you say, mm -hmm. I can see how something can change. And you just quietly make a small change. Uh, you, know, you slip something into the, into the process and somebody goes, what is that? That's a burn down chart. Instead of a, a release schedule, we're looking at a burn down or a burn down chart. Small things. Uh, the change doesn't happen. It's not like a big bang coming in three months, we're all agile. It's, it's now what's you know, the next phase we're looking at. So you recognize it, you can see it. Now look for ways on the team to help help drive drive the change. You'll find others will start to reflect on it too. Yeah, I would reiterate that when I first started at one of the companies I worked at, the first thing I did was they had sort of what they called an agile board, and it was I don't know, it was a mess, it was a hot mess. Um, so my first small suggestion was, this looks great. I love that you guys are doing this, but how about if we arranged it this way? And they're like, oh yeah. There's just that one small, let's rearrange your whiteboard. And you know, and then that was it for a couple of weeks. And then it was, hey, what if, what if we met every day and talked about what we're gonna do? And then, you know, when you encounter a problem, yeah. maybe I can help you, and they're like, oh my gosh, that's a great idea. Hey, yeah, okay, let's do that. Don't use the A word, don't use the A word. Yeah, don't use the A word. 
you see yeah, work. Just, just do the steps. That, yeah, uh, yeah. disguise yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, a big, a big uh, complaint about bad things about agile mm -hmm. is uh, what I hear is a lot of people are afraid of jargon they're using, yep. right? Mm -hmm. It's like Scrum and you know, Burnham and, and, and yeah. you don't have to use those terms if you if you don't want to. Like just like you can learn karate without speaking Japanese, like. <laughs> That's that's kind of important. If people are afraid that you're using these terms, then just introduce a change and don't use that scary term. Just you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be scrum. It can be let's just have a quick meeting or let's just go have coffee, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. okay. So the next one here, who was that? There was someone. Okay. <laughs> no matter. Okay. Uh, wait, there's a there's a queer. Okay. <laughs> so yes, sir. So I have a question. Um, when it comes to larger companies that are, I know it's a common trend these days, I mean, my company is doing this, we're in, they're trying to save office space, so they basically have people be mobile employees, which frankly is amazing, and we go to the office two days a week. Yeah, but from an agile perspective, how do you make that work? And I don't want to go to work five days a week. <laughs> so, Nobody does. Yeah. No one wants that. So how do you go around for that? Um, to manage it, that was a tough question. Work styles, work from home, and, yeah. and then, oh wait, we stand up every day in the office. Uh, they don't actually work well together. It's unfortunately, yeah. I found teams that, that, that are more together to work better, and there's also compromises where they'll take a second Friday off and more people work from home. But the trend is that mobile is great, but also working together is great. So they both are. And it's a contradiction right now for big companies. That's, I see it. Tough one to answer. So if anybody's done project management in, in Europe, they, they're big fans of Prince or Prince 2, which is kind of like using uh, feature teams or smaller teams that, that report to other teams that report to other teams. Uh, it's kind of like the telephone chain, but in reverse. Uh, so one trick I found was if you, if you have people that are co-located, and, and keep in mind that you know, the more people you have in your team, the more communication points there are, and at some point, you have more people, or more communication points than you have people, and it just becomes noise. So if you can keep your, your team smaller and say, well, you know what, these three guys work from Barry, so they're gonna, they're gonna be working on this feature, and they're gonna be their little own little scrum, and one of them's gonna report to mm -hmm. kind of the bigger scrum. Uh, that works, it's not ideal, like it's not as good as having everyone in the same room, but again, we have to, to consider that, you know, more and more people are, Hoteling or remote, remotely working or whatever you want to call it. And let me add this. Uh, the constraints may be a way to be more creative. So maybe that constraint, try to think with your group a different way to, to get together. So maybe a coffee, maybe a lunch. Maybe try to think some. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, as it is today, we do daily meetings every day, so they're typically always over the phone. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes live desktop, sometimes that sort. Um, but we also have two guys in the Philippines and two guys in South America, mm -hmm. and about a dozen of us here. But again, we're all working from home. Okay. <laughs> this week, so it's difficult to actually mm. collaborate sometimes. It's if you think about how you relate to people, and and you know, cut out the technology and cut out the job. How do you relate to people? you have something in common with them. So my suggestion to you would be those two days a week that you go into work, go to lunch with your team, or chat to your team about what you did on the weekend and what they did on the weekend. And the more you can relate to someone, the less that that telephone call is gonna be a constraint. You know, you'll, you'll be able to start reading people just over the phone. Hey Joe, you sound a little stressed out, you know, like just over the phone, because you've gotten to know him and you've gotten to chat with him. Um, and I think, I think breaking it down to the very basis of what it is, is it's just relating to people. So I would say try and be as social as you can in those times that you are in the office. We have two more questions. There will be no time for that, but we have two questions here. Closing and then we socialize and then you can make your question. Okay. Uh, I've seen one of the biggest challenges when people try to use agile is I'm an agile passion and I love it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I came from the waterfall and then I went to the rational fire thing and agile is my, exactly my, my job. And a lot of my friends, they look at me and say, Daniel, you guys are crazy, agile doesn't work at all. <laughs> and I, when I start to ask questions, 
some of them have realized they don't want to try at least, or they, want, they don't want to go for a job because they waterfall guy up here. Mm -hmm. But what I've seen that the biggest failures is when companies try to adopt a job, they just want to use a job because it's top friend. It's, it's fancy, you want to be cool. And I've seen that they fail because the executive team, they don't support them. So even if you, my personal opinion, if you try to adopt a job, I'm from a team, in IT department, but your product owner, your business, they're not dedicated to that. In my opinion, you just gonna have headaches, people turn, high turnovers, and people will not gonna follow this thing. And my and the biggest challenge as well is milestones and deadlines because I love Scrum and Agile because you really don't know what you want to do at the end, but you have an idea and you adjust and you adjust and you go and then at the end you find something. But people come already with a deadline and they say I want this in three in, in a year and you start doing sprints and you say sorry, I'm gonna, if you don't convince them that the quick delivery is good. They will say, hey, December 31st is my day, it doesn't matter if you deliver me at the So we'd like to hear from you guys, what do you think about that? Because for me, it's like, it's an endless war. Because they don't get it, what is agile, but they want to use waterfall things in agile, and those things just, they don't match, you know what I mean? Can I jump to this? Mm -hmm. yeah. What phone do you have? I have an old GG4. Uh, do you want an iPhone? If you want to give it to me for free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> convince iPhone users to change their phone? I don't convince. Mm. So I just use mine. I said, <laughs> I said, guys, when they asked me, why don't you buy an iPhone? I said, I'm not stupid to pay that much. So I'm, I'm <laughs> both, both, say, both of the phones are good to phone calls, message, if, and It depends right? what you want to use for. I have yeah. my Android has way more flexibility mm -hmm. and functionality than what yours have. And I don't have the money to pay. Yeah. Double for you guys. That's my explanation. Let's forget about the double. <laughs> but I'm just trying to say, try to take the best advantage of everything. So there are some good things in the waterfall products. Oh no! Products. I and I would like to mm -hmm. hear from the gurus here to say, what do you guys think? Because this is always a challenge. And I'm going to repeat what a guy told me here for one of them. Say, people don't get it. They don't. They don't know what is a challenge. That you might. They don't get it. But it's fascinating. It's really good when you apply. But it has to work, right? It has to come. Okay, any comments? So Hugo and I actually worked at a company and the executives didn't get it, like, at all. They would be in meetings and they'd say, oh yeah, we're doing agile. Yes. And I literally wanted to snap their fingers every time they did that. Um, <laughs> but what we said to them was, okay, we know you don't get it, but give us your trust. Give us your faith for six months. If in six months, you don't see a change and you don't see value, we'll go back to your waterfall. Just give us your faith. So thankfully for us, they blindly gave us their faith and went into meetings and said, yeah, we're doing agile because mm -hmm. they didn't get it. But in six months, we had several departments coming to us and saying, what are you guys doing and how do we do it? Mm -hmm. So we got that buy-in by showing them mm -hmm. the value. So if you can convince your executives, you know what, I know you don't get it, but just trust me for this amount of time yeah. so I can deliver some value to you. One of my, one of my great clients, yeah. sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the second project I'm working with them. First project, they said, we don't want to do Agile. We just, we have six months to do this. And if this is the third time we've tried to do this. We've failed before, so we want, we want to be successful. So I'm like, okay, well, first of all, if this is the third time you've tried to do this and you fail every single time, why don't we change something, right? Because we all know the definition of insanity. So let's change something so that we can have expect different results. And let's keep your six month deadline, but we're going to change uh, one thing. We're going to deliver every two weeks. And every two weeks, we're actually going to push this to production. And it doesn't matter how crappy it is or how good it is, we're not gonna compromise the quality, but we're going to deliver something. And the other thing we're going to do is we're going to have the, all the business users, they're going to meet with us every day for 15 minutes. We're going to stand up so nobody feels comfortable and stuff. Uh, so again, what started happening is we started by building that relationship where it was, it was not a, a ransom, it was, it was like a relationship where we're working together. And we're able to uh, adapt to change because if uh, I as a developer am saying I'm trying to figure out this issue and the business user is here, the business user can say, oh, I can take care of this, I, I know the answer to this, or no, we don't need to worry about this. 
So what happened is we still delivered, you know, in those within those six months, but we were ready to go live probably after two months. And when we actually went live, it was it was like an on event. Like it was not one of those where everybody had to come in on the weekend and you know say goodbye to their families. No, we actually it was just another build, and we happened to go live, and there was tons of stuff that didn't work in the, when we went live. And guess what? None of stakeholders got got emotional about it because they said, "We know you guys will fix it," and we fixed it a couple of days later. So it's it's it. So you take what they're willing to give you, and you you make those small changes. I mean. It's erosion. <laughs> <laughs> Can we go to the next question? Yes, I want to just hold flat. Yeah, I love ahead. your passion, and I love that you said the word love, because I think that's something that many of us have been through at Agile Transformations have come to that point where, you know, at least I do, it's with people. That adoption, the change isn't easy. And there are times where it's, it's not easy, and it's not successful, but that's where you think you can make a change, and, and Agile is about going through that. Sandra. Send us a message telling us how you made it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Last question, please. Uh, hi. Um, so I work as a product manager for um, uh, as a, um, software as a service BP application in the airline industry, and it's a startup. We're in the first part of year two of the startup, and this is a big product. Like this is this is huge. And no piece is really small enough to fit into an iteration or into a sprint. So I guess my question is, how do you take something that large um, and get a value unit out of it within a short period of time within, that you can actually prove? You know, I don't want to drop it down to changing the color of the logo. It needs to obviously be bigger than that. but. It can't be a feature, it can't even be a feature in the product because a feature in the product is 12, 18 weeks long from a development. There's just so much integration, so much whatever. So how do you, and maybe this is more for Krista from a product owner, product manager perspective, how do you take something that's that large and, and chunk it into value units and show development but then turn around and show your client at the same time that you aren't going to see the whole picture for a bit but here's enough that you can get excited about it. Well exactly what you said, like here's enough that you can get excited about it. So I imagine your 12 to 18 weeks are, are that long because you're tying into different systems or whatever, right? So one project that I worked on was an incredibly large system too, very complex. Our first iteration was I can log in. That was our, our user story. As a person, I can log in. <laughs> and you know, the executives were too happy about that. They're like, seriously, you guys can't do any more than that. Um, but there is kind of always a way to break it down. So I would say working closely with your UI and UX people, um, even if you're delivering some prototypes and, and explaining to them at the end of a sprint, this is going to eventually tie into this system and this is how it will function, but this is what we've completed to date. So um, I, would, I would push back and challenge you a little bit to, to try and look a little closer and, and see how you could break it down. Because I think if you, if you look a little closer, you'll, you'll find you will be able to break it down. Yeah. And Krista will always say, uh, if everything's important, nothing's important. <clears throat> So yes. unfortunately, sometimes your stakeholders don't want to give up on something. That's when you look at, uh, well, there's a technical risk and there's a the business risk. So the technical risk is this big component that these two systems you know, need to talk to each other. Uh, and if that doesn't happen, then the whole system fails. So that's probably one of the first things to start looking at is, can we get these two things to talk to each other? It's not going to be very exciting, it's not going to be very pretty, yep. but if I can you know, send you a message and you do something with it, and, like I call a database and it returns me a hard-coded John Smith 123 Main Street, uh, that's great because for after that sprint, the team that's working on the database can start connecting to the real data. The team that's talking to the, the screens can start plugging that data into real screens, right? But that's one of the highest technical risks. Any points of integration, uh, is, is where things fail. Usually what you'll hear is the opposite, where it's like the team is going, we're doing great, we're on time, we're on time, and then two weeks before the project goes live, 
They say, oops, we're six months behind. <laughs> so short of the rip in the fabric of time, that shouldn't happen, right? And what usually happens is they go, well, I thought you were doing this, and I thought you, you know, I, I'm sending you a country code, not the, uh, you know, so get rid of that first. That's the first thing. The second thing is, Sorry? 30 seconds? Oh. Time boxing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So the second thing. Email the second thing is talk to us after. I'm done. Uh, no, so the second thing is your users, when they try to talk to IT people, they try to talk in an IT language, right? And they're trying to tell you, tell us stuff in the way they think we don't want to hear. The best way to find, like, get feedback is to present them with something visual. So get the screens out there. Like if you can't do everything, get the screens out there. Get them using the screens. Get them clicking around. Because they're going to see right away the stuff that they don't like, and they're going to give you feedback. Uh, if you're working with, let's say, bankers and accountants, right? Don't ask them to be creative, because their job is to look at columns and make sure everything you know, checks and balances are there. So give them something that they can do checks and balances, right? I asked for this feature. I asked for this screen, um, and that's that's how I would approach it. So, sure. seconds. Exciting time to be a product owner. A very exciting time to be a product owner. Yeah. In the evolution from product manager to product owner, you're, you're defining the role. It's going to define, I think, from recruiting to growth. It's one of the most exciting right now. Epic level of prioritization. Google that. You just frequently get into the features and functions and pick two or three epics that you're doing and then turn everything else off. That If you can get that mindset where the epic is a business value, everybody in the company knows we're doing this and this. We're not doing this and this right now. Then you can drive into the features of those. Get that to a point, that'll help. That's like getting my executive to understand the agile is a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> it takes a, it takes getting a them to yeah. stream, streamline my roadmap. Talk about the ethics, talk about the value of what's, what's coming in each function. Yeah. Invite him to the next event. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, final statements. One minute. For five seconds. One minute. I'll just share that this is a community. Agile is a. Is a Evolution revolution that's happening, it's quite pervasive, and we're all in it together, we're all going together. Uh, you've heard a lot from us. You can kind of get a call to this called the bus stop tour, where you go through New York and see all the different sites, so you don't get a chance to go in. Now is, it, now is an opportunity to go and visit, get into them. There's so many aspects of this that are actually skills in the trade of what we do, how we do IT. You know, we didn't talk about user stories, we didn't talk about metrics and measurement. Measure everything. Keep track of the little thing. Although it's agile, we should just you know, be free and do everything. Uh, we actually, it's an empirical, visible, open way of working. And if you have data and measurements, people aren't saying, well, you told me that was this, that's not this. You put the, the numbers down, people come around that. So start to measure, start to share, uh, and uh, Thank you. Um, I would say, you know, long standing, very traditional companies, banks, insurance companies, government, they are all starting to go agile. So if that doesn't speak to you, I'm not sure what will. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's where the movement is going. So I hope it's something that you're excited about. I hope it's something that you're passionate about. Um, passion is contagious, and um, if if you're passionate about it, it, it might be struggle at first, but it will start to spread. So yeah, <coughs> it's a community. Look into it more. Do research. Talk to people. Thank you. I would actually pose a challenge to everyone here. If you're already using Agile or considering using Agile, take the duration of your sprint. Let's say it's four weeks or two weeks. Try to cut it by half. If it's one week, then don't do that. <laughs> but try to cut it by half because, you know, what you can do in that extra week is not that much. But the, the opportunities that you're losing by, by not getting feedback from those people a week earlier, is huge. So don't try to do, I know the first thing was people will say, well, I want to do a four week sprint or a six week sprint because you know, it gives us some time. No, you know what? Do two week sprint or one week sprint. Get feedback. Don't be afraid of failing. Don't be afraid of looking like an idiot because all the stuff is not going to work perfectly, but people are going to see stuff and they're going to get excited and they're going to buy in quickly. Yeah. And I would add, so start tonight, just Google, read a paragraph, tomorrow can read a, an article, uh, the next week maybe a book, or another event, so yeah, start. That's a good point, because that Agile TO, 
uh, other meetups in the area, mm -hmm. maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. Agile Drake's launching this month, so chance to talk, meet people, network, and we'll charge your Agile Drake's back. Thank you very much. Call. Oh, Quick things, like I said earlier, if you guys have any ideas for future events, please let us know. Um, another thing, if you're looking for work, we're in the IT staff industry, so feel free to reach out to any of us with t-shirts. Uh, and last, I just want to thank everyone. That was awesome. So thank you for coming, and thank you all. Thank for, you. Uh,